Hi there, I'm Jeremy O'Carroll, founder and director of the Fitzroy Learning Centres. Welcome to this training video. In today's video, we're going to be talking to you about phonics and just why it's so important with the Fitzroy Method. Now, for those of you who are familiar with our program, you'll know that it's a phonics program and it's therefore essential that you have a very good working knowledge of phonics systems to be able to teach our program. If you're not familiar with phonics, if you don't know how phonics works, then you're actually not going to be able to teach our program very effectively at all. So in this video, what I'm going to do is just run through some of the basics of phonics and I'm also going to talk to you about some of the problems that often occur in phonics teaching. Let's begin by defining phonics. What exactly is phonics? Well, to begin with, I'd like to just make a simple point that to understand phonic systems, the key thing actually is simply to realize that all phonic systems use the alphabet. And what exactly is the alphabet? Well, the alphabet is nothing else but a sound code. In other words, each letter stands for a sound. So if we take a look at a word like ant, then ant is made up of three sounds, at, n, t. And when we run them together, at, n, t, we get the word ant. And that's exactly how phonics programs work. Now, this is pretty basic. What I'd like to do now, though, is actually run you through some of the troublesome areas. These areas where even sometimes experienced teachers can run into a little bit of strife. Now, I'm actually going to be presuming in this video that you do have some phonics experience. In other words, I want, I'm hoping that you at least know the basic sounds the letters make. If you're not familiar with the basic sounds the letters make, and perhaps this is because you've never used a phonics program or you've never been taught a phonics program, then what you're going to need to do is actually go on to the internet and or perhaps just use some of our materials like the Fitzroy sounds to educate yourself as to the sounds each letters make. Now this is an absolute uh, first step for teaching our program. You need to know the sounds the letters make. But I'm going to be presuming at the moment that you do know them and what I'm going to be doing then is taking you through some of the letters that still tend to cause teachers difficulty. Before I do that though, I'd like to just point out an important point that there's actually a key difference between letter names and letter sounds. Now, the difference is quite simply that letter names are things like A, B, C, D, and E, but the letter sounds are the sounds those letters make, like A, B, K, D. And they're very, two very different things. And with phonics programs, actually, the only thing we're concerned with are the sounds the letters make because it's by using these sounds that we can actually start to learn to read and write, that we can actually start to form words. For instance, k, a, t, they're the three sounds. We run them together and we get the word cat. Now, the reason the names of letters don't help us is simply that we could say c, a, t, but we can't really hear the cat from the c, a, t, and that's why. If we were two parents and we were discussing whether we should get our little girl a cat but we're not really sure and she is present, we might say, well, do you think we should get Jessica a C-A-T knowing full well that she won't know what it is? But if we said, should we get Jessica a cat to she might well perk up and think, oh, a cat, a cat. And she then, of course, she'll want the cat yesterday. And so as you can see, there's a very big difference between the letter names and the letter sounds. So just make sure that when you're teaching our program, you're focusing on the letter sounds. Okay, now there is an issue which arises, however, here, and that is that many times the students you get to your classrooms actually already know the letter names. And so it's pretty confusing then. They come along to class, they know these letter names, they can even recognize some of the letters, and all of a sudden they look at a letter which they'd always recognized as an A and you tell them that it's an A and well, it is confusing. So what you've got to do then is find out a way to help them 
differentiate between letter names and letter sounds and understand the difference in terms that they can understand. Not terms that you can understand, but in terms that a child can understand. Now, there's a very basic game we can play at this point, and it's quite simply this. Ask your students whether they have, say, a pet cat. And if one of them has a pet cat, ask for the name, and the name might be, oh, Puss Puss. And you can say, well, okay, you've got a cat, and its name is Puss Puss, but what sound does Puss Puss make? And then they're going to say, eh, cow, or something to that effect. So then you've got a name, Puss Puss, and you've got a sound, meow, and they're very different. You can play the game again. You can say, well, does anyone have a pet dog? And they can say, oh, yeah, I've got a pet dog. And one of them puts up their hand and says, the name of the dog is, say, Rover. And you say, okay, your dog's name is Rover, but what sound does Rover make? And then they're going to say something like, ruff, ruff. and you can see that the two things are very different. You've got a name, Rover, a sound, ruff. Uh, and by doing it in this way, it's very easy for kids to say, oh yeah, things often have names, but you know what? The sound these things make is very different from the names. Likewise with letters. They've got a name, A, but the sound that letter makes is A. Ah. Again, quite different. So if you explain it to your students in these terms, then they're going to very quickly recognize the difference between the two and not feel confused. Okay, let's move on now then to some of the difficult letters. These are letters that often prove difficult to teachers. Okay, now the first type of letters which proves difficult to teachers from time to time are the vowels. Now why are the vowels potentially problematic? Well, quite simply because they make several different sounds. You've got long vowel sounds, short vowel sounds, schwas, that's the uh sounds, uh, all sorts of different sounds that they can potentially make as opposed to some letters which just make the one sound. So what I'd like to do now is just play a little exercise with you where what you need to do is try to think up words beginning with the basic letter sound a. So when I say the basic letter sound, what I really mean is simply the sound a letter makes. So A has the basic letter sound a. So what you need to do is give me some words like you know, ant or apple, words like this or arrow, which start with an A and the basic vowel sound. So just in your own head right now, just take a little bit of time to perhaps even write down a few words starting with this basic vowel sound, A. Okay, I hope you've written down some words. Now, what I want you to check though is that they actually do start with the sound at not just the letter A. Because here's where a lot of people go wrong. They will write down words like aeroplane. Uh, an aeroplane does, in fact, start with the letter A, but it doesn't start with the sound A. It starts with the sound A, e, which is quite different. So if you've got words like aeroplane or apricot, that starts with an A sound, then Unfortunately, they're not the correct ones for this exercise. And the importance of this when you're teaching children is in the initial stages when you're giving them example words, etc. You're going to have to limit these words to words starting just with the basic sounds of letters, for instance, in this case, at. Another exercise I'd like to play very quickly with you now is to flip things around. So what I want you to do now is think of some words that start with an A but not an A sound. Words like apricot, aeroplane or air. So just spend a little bit of time now, write down a few words, as I said, that begin with an A but not an A sound. Okay. I hope you've written down some words. Now, I want you to just check that they all, in fact, do start with an A and don't start with an A sound. So you can self-correct yourself here, and I hope you did well. Let's now move on to the second vowel, E. And now what sound does the letter E make? It makes an E sound. Now, if you're from Malaysia or Singapore, you actually have to be a little bit careful here because 
the sound you make for the letter E is a little bit strange, and often it's like an A sound, A, which is almost more like the sound the letter A makes. So what you really need to do at this point is put the letter sound in context. In other words, give it something like E as in egg. It's not A for egg, it's E for egg. So make sure that your the sound you the letter E makes is an E, not an A. Now this is Maybe it's hard for you to even hear the difference, but you've got to practice it. So as I said, practice it in content. E for egg. E for extra. E for extraordinary. E for empty. You know, put it in the context of different words, and then you can clearly hear the sound. Don't make the mistake, though, of giving it more of an at sound, which, as I said, in Singapore and Malaysia, teachers are often tempted to do, because that seems to be how they pronounce this letter sound. Okay, so let's run through the same exercise we did for the letter A. What I want you to do now is just write down a few words beginning with the letter E and the basic letter sound for it, the E sound. So words like egg, words like empty, words like the ones we've just mentioned. So pause the video for a moment here, write down a few words and then come back. Okay, hope you've written down some words. Now, just be very careful that they do all start with the sound E. Make sure that they're not other words which, yes, start with an E, but not the sound E. For instance, eagle starts with an E, yes, but it doesn't start with an E sound. It's an E sound. Okay, let's flip it around then, and let's play another exercise. What I want you to do now is to actually think of words that, like eagle, that start with the letter E, but not the basic vowel sound, E. So write down, if you can, four words for me. Pause the video now, and then come back. Okay, hope you've written down four words. Now I want you to go through them and just be very careful that they all start with an E, but not an E sound. Now, why am I getting you to do these exercises? I'm getting you to do them so that you are very clear on what words use basic letter sounds and what words use other sounds like long vowel sounds, sometimes digraphs, and other things which will need to be taught in a phonics program but won't want to be introduced too early on in the piece. So, let's go on to the third vowel. I, what sound does it make? It makes an I for ink sound. So again, I just want you to jot down a few words beginning with the letter I and the basic vowel sound I, words like ink or igloo. So put down, pause the video, put down say five words beginning with the basic vowel sound I and the letter I and then come back to the video. Okay. Hope you've got your five words. Now just be very careful that they aren't words like ice cream or island, because these words do start with the letter I, but not the basic vowel sound I. In the case of island and ice cream, we've got more of a long vowel sound beginning them. Okay, now flip it around again, and what I want you to do is the exact reverse, and find words that begin with the letter I, but not the basic vowel sound I. Words like, as we just said, island and ice cream, or ice. Okay, so pause the video, write down three words like that, and then come back. Okay, hope you got your three words. Uh, just check to make sure that none of them use the short vowel sound I. And then let's move on to the next vowel, which is O. Now what, what vowel sound, basic sound does the letter O make? Well, it makes an O sound as in octopus or orange. So what I want you to do now is again, pause the video and write down five words beginning with the basic vowel sound O and also beginning with the letter O words, as we said, like octopus. So, pause the video, jot down these five words, and then come back. Okay, hope you've got your five words there. Now, what you have to make sure is that these words not only begin with the letter 
O, but also the basic vowel sound O. So if you've got any words like open or oval, uh, then they're not going to be correct because these words, although they start with the letter O, don't start with the vowel sound, the basic letter sound O. Okay, so let's flip it around again. Play it the reverse exercise where what you have to do is find words that begin with the letter O but not the basic letter sound O. Words, as we said, like oval and open. Okay, so pause the video, write down three words like that and then come back. Okay, welcome back. Just check that with the words you've, the three words you've just written, none of them begin with the short vowel sound O. Oh. Okay, once you've done that, then let's move on to the final vowel sound, which is uh, for the letter U, that's an U uh sound, U uh, as in umbrella, or ugly, or up. So what I want you to do now again is pause the video and write down five words that begin with the basic letter sound U uh, and the letter U. So pause the video, write down these five words, and then come back. Welcome back. Hope you've got your five words there. Now what you have to do is just double check them to make sure that none of them, or that all of them, start with an uh sound. So make sure you don't have any words like unicorn or university, because although these words start with a U, they don't start with the basic letter sound ah. Uh. So, just check those words and then we're going to flip it around again, and I just want you to write three words now that begin with the letter U, but not the basic letter sound, ah. Uh, words like the unicorn or unique. Okay, so try to find three words, put them down, and then come back to the video. Okay, great. Well, now we've gone through all of the vowels, let's move on to some other potential areas of difficulty. But actually, before we do, I, I want to just point out one thing, and this goes back to uh, the letter A and some problems that might be associated with it. Remember we said that we gave examples of words that began with the letter A but not the basic letter sound A? Words like aeroplane. Now, if you think of a, a classroom, what do you often find on the walls? We often find alphabet freezers. You know, they're the ones where you've got an image and a letter underneath it. So you might have a picture of an apple and underneath it an A. Well, apart from apple, oftentimes you'll see a picture of an aeroplane. Now, if we're not learning phonics, this isn't a real problem, but if we're learning with a phonics system, this is going to be confusing to your children because, as we said earlier, Aeroplane begins with A, but not the basic letter sound A. So what you're going to need to do then is if you've got a, an alphabet freeze that isn't a phonics one, then you're actually going to need to put paste over the A or the aeroplane with a new image and make it something like an apple, which actually will work phonically. Okay, let's now go on to another troublesome letter, and that's the letter X. Now what sound does the letter X make? The letter X makes the sound k -s, k -s, as in a C and an S run together, or a K and S run together. Now, what difficulties do we encounter with this letter? Well, the main difficulty is that there actually aren't any words in the English language that start with the letter X and the sound so if you think back to the alphabet freeze, what images do you usually see associated with the letter X? Well, one common one's a xylophone. But the problem with xylophone is it doesn't start with a X sound, it starts with a Z sound. What else do we often see? Well, we often see an X-ray, but if you think of X-ray, what's the first actual sound in X-ray? It's an E sound, so it's more like E for X-ray. And again, that's just not appropriate. Now, unfortunately, we actually don't have a letter or a word in the English language, as I said, that starts with the letter X and the sound X. 
So we need to kind of create a workaround. Now the best one you can do is something like this, x as in box, or x as in fox. It's not ideal, but it does work, and it's the best solution there is. Okay, now let's move on to two more letters, the letter L and the letter R. Now, what potential difficulties might arise here? Well, if you're in an Asian country, uh, and a country which speaks Asiatic languages, then often they people in these countries struggle to hear the difference between the sound the letter L and the letter R makes. That's why sometimes we make a joke about, you know, going to the Chinese restaurant and getting our favourite fried lice. And that probably wouldn't be very tasty. So, if you're in a, a, a country where English is actually commonly spoken, however, this isn't really going to be such an issue. Sometimes I think teachers can make the mistake of overworking a point. So your children come in and you hear that they struggle to differentiate between the sound the letter L and the letter R makes and what you tend to do is just correct them and give them, test them and test them over and over again until you hope they actually get to hear the difference. The problem is that this process actually takes time. New neural pathways need to be created from the ear to the brain uh, helping children to actually hear this difference. And they take time, so it's not going to be the case that you can get a student and just through repetition over, you know, 30 minutes, you're going to get them to hear the difference between the two. If they've been brought up in a family that only speaks, say, Chinese or Japanese, they're going to struggle for a little bit. The good news, however, is if you're in a country like Singapore or Malaysia where English is commonly spoken, then over time, just through exposure to the English language, children are going to pick up uh, the difference between these two letters and they're going to do it fairly quickly. So actually the best thing if you're in a country that does speak English frequently is not to really worry about students making these mistakes. If when they come into your classes as three, four, five-year-olds, uh, they make the mistake and the letter sound for the letter R and L sound pretty well the same, don't even make an issue of it. Just in time you'll notice that they self-correct themselves. If, however, you're in a country where English isn't uh, a first language, then you are going to need to do, from time to time, a little bit of practice. But make this practice something which occurs over a good period of time. Make it over, you know, three months, six months, a year. Children don't need to get things perfect straight away. As I said, neural pathways take need time to form, so just teach them a bit here, a bit there, and over time watch them learn to recognise the difference between these two sounds. Okay, let's move on now to the letters G and the letters C. Now what potential difficulties could arise here? Yes, you've guessed it, they both make more than one sound. So in the case of the letter G, its basic letter sound is G as in goat, but it can also make the sound j. Now again, if you've got a, an alphabet freeze, you're going to have to be careful at this point because what picture is often placed above the letter G? Well, it's often a giraffe. Now a giraffe starts with a j sound, which is something totally different to a g sound. So in order to avoid confusing your students, what you're going to need to do is just create an image of something like a goat and paste it over the giraffe so that then children see the goat instead of the giraffe above the letter G. With the letter C, well, it can make, its basic letter sound is a K, but it can also make a S sound. So again, just make sure that the image on your alphabet chart is in fact something like a cat, not a word like a snake, for instance. But that isn't really very common, but just notice that, you know, the letter C does make more than one sound. Okay, let's move on then to the letters M and the letters N. Now, what sound do these letters make? Well, the letter M makes a M mm sound and the letter N makes a M mm sound. But often you might know that they get taught a little differently, like the letter M making the sound M and the letter N making the sound N. Now, these days, using m and n tends to be frowned upon, 
but perhaps a little bit more than it needs to be. What you'll discover is that when a word starts with the letter M or the letter N, then the M and the N work perfectly. It's just that sometimes when you get an M or an N in the middle or towards and the end of a word, then they don't make the M and the N sound. And that's why it's technically a little bit more correct to teach the M and the N because they're going to work wherever the M is or the N is found in the word. Now, that's not to say, however, that teaching m and n is never useful. In fact, it will be useful in circumstances where your student or students struggle to really hear or say the m or the n. If you have children who are struggling to catch on to the sound this letter makes, then sometimes it's actually okay to teach them m or n, and then over time teach them the other potential sound, which is more of a uh, the m or the n. And what you'll find here is that, to begin with, children will, who have previously struggled with the m or the n can quite easily use the m and the n, and then you know once they're a little bit more competent at reading and writing and hearing sounds, then as I said later on, you can teach them the m and the n, and this works well. In fact, I think we should remember that. People like my grandparents' generation all actually learnt m and n. That was the sounds these letters made. You know, if we go back sixty or so years, so and and these par you know the grandparents' generation all learnt exceedingly well to read. So it does work, even though it's technically frowned upon a little bit more today. Uh, but my suggestion to you is just don't use it straight away. But if your children are struggling to really hear the sounds for these letters M and N, then don't feel bad about introducing the M and the N. Okay. Finally, I'd just like to look at the letter Q and ask you what sound does the letter Q make? Think about it for a moment. Yep, that's right. The sound the letter Q makes is a Q sound. As in a K and a W strung together, or a C and a W strung together. Okay, so what do we know then about English? Well, we know it uses an alphabet. We know the English alphabet has twenty-six letters, and we know that each letter represents a sound. But the important thing to note here is they don't all represent a unique sound. Sometimes these sounds double up. For instance, look at the sound the letter C makes, k, and look at the sound the letter K makes. Oh, it almost also makes a k sound. So we're actually only getting one basic letter sound from two letters here. And in fact, we can look at other letters like the letter X, and we see that it's made up of actually two other sounds: the k sound and the s sound. What this means is, in a way, we almost could have done without these letters. Because you can actually form, say, the sound of x with other letters. Now, this is going to be important in a moment because what we're going to find out is that English actually has between 44 to 45 sounds in the language, but we've only got 26 letters. We've just discovered that we're not even getting 26 sounds from these letters. So, how then do we bridge the gap from, say, around about 23 different sounds to 44 or 45? Well. The way we're going to do that is with a thing called digraphs.、And、we're going to have a look at those in a moment. Before we do, though, I want to just show you a remarkable fact about learning with a phonics reading program, and it's quite simply this: that you can teach children to learn the, just the twenty-six basic letter sounds to recognise the letters and the sounds they make, and immediately after that, they are actually going to be able to read and write. Thousands upon thousands of words in the English language. Now that takes a little bit of time to learn the first the the, the alphabet. You know these twenty six letters, and that's why, in a sense, phonics programs take just a little bit more time to get going than programs like whole language. Think about it. If you were learning under a whole language system, on the very first day of class, you might even be able to get your students to recognise. Words like ice cream or cake or even big ones like football. What you'd do is you'd show them an image of, say, a football. You'd show them the word 
written out of football, you show them together together many times, and before you knew it, they could probably actually then guess if you held up the word, the letters for football, they could actually read football. So then they could go home to mum or dad and say, hey mum, dad, guess what I can do? I can read the words football and cake, uh, all the you know, difficult words. And the parents are like, wow, this school must be like really good. But the problem is learning words like that takes time. Every word takes quite a bit of rote sort of learning, memory, flashing of the card, showing the letter, doing this many, many times so that before the children actually learn to recognise what the word is. And you have to learn, you know, one word after the next. And because English has so many words, thousands upon thousands, hundreds of thousands in fact, then it's almost impossible to learn to read and write everything using this method because it's simply too taxing on the memory. Whereas with phonics programs, what we're really doing is we're getting a set of tools to decode the written words and so if you've got words like for instance uh, picnic now picnic is a reasonably long word for a little child but we can break it down very simply into its sounds ik, n -ik, picnic and then you can read the word picnic just from those letter sounds so what I'd actually like you to do now is a simple little exercise I want you to write down five words that can be written just using the basic letter sounds. So words like picnic. I don't want you to have words like, say, unique, because the first sound in unique is U, and we've got the letter U, but a different sound. We haven't got the basic letter sound, ah. Uh. So write down five words. Words like, we've got down there some examples, trumpet, or confident, or pond, all of these words you can actually form just using the basic letter sounds. So write down five words using just the basic letter sounds. Pause the video now and once you've written those five words, come back to me. Okay, now what I want you to do is just check through them and make sure that you can sound out all of those words just basic letter sound by basic letter sound. Often at this point, people make a mistake. They have words like think. Okay, and if we look at the word think, what's the first actual sound? It's a th. What we've done is we've taken a T, we've taken an H, we've put them together to create a new sound, a th. In a moment we'll see that that's called a digraph, but for now it's important just to notice that you can't use the basic letter sounds because that would be a t, I, n, k. So unless you gave it a very Asiatic kind of pronunciation, pink, then it's not going to work. So to get the th sound, we need to actually use this letter combination or digraph. But what we're wanting in this exercise is simply words that you can sound out letter sound by letter sound by letter sound. And what I hope you found is actually there are a lot of them in the English language. So just teaching children the basic 26 letters of the alphabet actually equips them wonderfully to be able to read thousands of thousands of English words. And that really is one of the great strengths of a phonics reading program. Okay, so let's go back to a topic we were talking about just a moment before. We said English has 26 letters or written symbols. Uh, we said it makes up roughly 44 to 45 sounds. But how then do we bridge the gap from, you know, the, well, what was really turned out to be more like 23 sounds, which unique sounds that the letters of the alphabet made up to the 44 or 45 sounds of the English language. Now just a note on 44 or 45, you might be asking, well, how many sounds is it? Is it 45 or 44? Well, that kind of depends on where you draw the line. So some experts say 44, some say 45. But for now, we don't need to go into great detail there. We just need to know that more or less it will make English language has 44 to 45 sounds. Okay, so the solution though, as we've kind of touched on, to create more sounds is simply by putting letters together to create a new sound. So if you look down at the bottom of this slide, which we're now going to show you, then you'll see that we've got digress like ch and all and shun. And these digraphs uh, are formed by adding different letters together and then we get a totally new sound. Now the thing to remember is that we're actually creating a new sound, something totally different from the basic letter sound. So if we have uh, the letter sh, or the digraph shun, 
then we've the basic letter sounds would be t i o n, which is very different from the sh sound. So you see, digress are creating a totally new sound. Let's take a look at the two reader images we've got there. We've got reader fifteen now. Think about it. What digraph do you think is being taught there in reader fifteen? Yep, you guessed it. The digraph all, as in tall and small. What about reader seventeen? What digraph do you think's being taught there? Yep, the sh, as in fish. Now, there's a very important thing to note here, and that is that digraphs are not blends. A lot of you will be used to using blends, and will even have been teaching blends in your classroom. Well, what I want to tell you now is, in the Fitzroy method, we do not use blends as a teaching method. Why not? Well, let's try to work out exactly what a blend is. Blends can be described in different ways, and you've got different sorts of blends. What you could call perhaps blends or pseudo blends. But let's just have a have a look at a few to make the matter clear. Let's look at a word like a blend, like k at. Okay, so we've got the k and the blend at. What's really happening here? What's happening is quite simply that we're running the at and the t quickly together to get the sound at. But the sound at isn't a new sound. It's not, it's simply the basic letter sounds strung together. So it's not like ch, you know, where you get the k and the To form a totally new sound, ch, it's something different. It's just using the basic letter sounds. So our argument is quite simply this: if blends are nothing other than the basic letter sounds run together, then what you really should be doing is focusing on these basic letter sounds. Just spend extra time teaching those, and you won't ever need to teach a blend. Because if you start teaching blends, then what you're actually doing is making life far more complicated for your students. Why is that? Well, think about it. What is the beautiful thing about the English alphabet? The most wonderful thing about it is that it only uses twenty-six different symbols. Okay, fifty-two if you count capital letters. But for the basic lowercase letters, you've got twenty-six symbols to learn. That's not too many. That makes it quite easy. I mean, compare this to a language like Chinese, where you've got thousands and thousands and thousands of characters. Learning to read, therefore, is a very difficult task. But in English, with only these few symbols, it makes things manageable. But if we start teaching blends like at and、uh, gl for glad and things like this, then what we're really doing is we're adding dramatically to the number of symbols that children need to learn to read and write. And this is going to lead to confusion. And in fact, often what you're going to find if you teach a lot of blends, children might be able to read the at blend, as in k at. But actually, they'll forget the a and the t if you just have the letters by themselves. So, save time. You don't need to teach blends. Just focus on the basic letter sounds and know that your students will, without any problems whatsoever, be able to decode any blend you throw at them. Because a blend, as we said, is just the basic letter sounds run together. If you just look at the slide we've got there, and you look at the words we've got on the right side. Of the slide, words like wood and boat. What you'll notice there is they're actually proper digraphs because we're not going w o o d. We're actually putting the two o sounds together to create something totally new and u sound. Same with the o and the a in boat. It's not o at. It's not b o at. It's b o t. So we've put the o and the a together to create a totally New sound, and that's how we define a digraph. We're putting two or more letters together to form a totally new sound. Now, for some of the, you who are experts in etymology, in other words, the origins of words and where they come from, then you might be shaking your head a little bit at our use of the term digraph because di technically means two, and so. If we wanted to be a little bit more precise, when we put two letters together, we'd say digraph.、Uh, that's two letters to form a new sound. And if we put three letters together to form a new sound, we'd say trigraph. And if we put four, we'd say quadgraph. But the problem is, it gets a little bit complicated there. 
in our method, what we want to do is always keep things as simple as possible. We don't want to make life difficult for anyone. We don't need more educated terms. We just want to teach reading and writing. And so to do that, what we've done is we've simplified and we've made it just one term for all cases. Two or more letters put together to form a new sound is a digraph in our system. Okay, so once you've learnt the basic letter sounds and once you've learnt the digraphs, then things actually become a good deal easier when where reading is concerned. Let's have a look at some of these words we've got here. We've got a word like moonlight, and let's see if we can break it down into its component parts. Well, the first part we've got a mm, then we've got an oo, mm, then we've got a n, mm, then a l, and then we've got an i, and then a t. Moonlight. Okay, so you see all we've done is we've strung together the basic letter sounds, the digraphs to form the entire word. And in fact, once we know the main digraphs in the English language and once we know the basic letter sounds, then we're going to be able to read a huge percentage of English words. Let's have a look at the word leaping and let's see if we can break it down in its component parts. So we've got the first sound is L, then next is E, then P, then ING. So we've got a few basic letter sounds, or a couple, of, two basic letter sounds and two digraphs. We put them together and we get the word leaping. Okay, that all sounds pretty good. We, we learn basic letter sounds, we learn digraphs, and all of a sudden we can read thousands and thousands of English words, but we all know at the same time that English is and can be a little bit irregular. And that's perhaps one reason why people went off phonic systems for a period of time and started using systems like whole language because the argument ran, English is so irregular that there almost isn't any point learning rules. Well, is that true? Let's look at a, a, a sentence now and see just how much of it could be considered phonic and how much non-phonic. So the sentence we've got here is the cat was on the mat. Now if we break it down into non-phonic and phonic words, for non-phonic we get that, was and that, and for phonic we get cat, on and mat. So here we see that about 50% of this sentence is phonic, we can just sound it out using phonic rules, and 50% of it is irregular. So is this a true reflection of the English language as a whole? Is phonics only good to cover about 50%? Well, let's have a look. In fact, what we're going to find is that phonic systems do far better than that. But we need to learn a few key components. And if we do, we're going to discover a remarkable fact. That just by using phonics, we're actually going to be able to decode or read 90 to 95% of the English language. So, what are the key components that we need to learn to be able to read 90 to 95% of the English language? Well, first thing was quite simply the basic letter sounds. We learn those. Then the next thing is we learn the digraphs. Now, in our system, we have about 60 key digraphs which we teach. So we learn the digraphs. Then we also need to learn what's called phonic rules. Now, what exactly is a phonic rule? Well, Let's have a look at, at this next slide and we'll see a word like get and then imagine we want to add the ing to make it getting. Well, how do we do that? How do we get transform get to getting? Well, we learned that you actually have to double the t. Now, why do you double the t? You have to double the t so that we can maintain the short vowel sound, the et sound. If we actually didn't double the t, then we'd get have, the word would be pronounced geeting because the, it would then have a long vowel sound. So what you learn is when you've got a word which, uh, a single syllable word which has a short vowel sound, when you want to add, say, ing to the end, you've got to actually double the consonant on the end. And that's just a, that's just a grammar rule. And in our program, we teach a number of these rules and they are all going to help you read and write more effectively. Okay, so you've learnt the basic letter sounds, you've learnt the digraphs, you've learnt the spelling rules. What else do you need to learn? We actually need to learn the 50 most common special words. Now, what exactly is a special word? A special word is an irregular word. It's a word that you can't learn a phonics rule for and you just have to memorise it. Words a bit like said or I, uh, these words, it's very difficult to find a rule for. Now, 
Okay, technically you can find a rule for most of these words, but it's so obscure uh, and it relates to so few words that it's not really worth reading. So it's actually simpler in these cases simply to memorize some of these key words. So if you memorize the 50 most common special words, then what you're going to be able to do is uh, actually read in, well, when you learn these in conjunction with the basic letter sounds, the special, uh, the digraphs and the phonic spelling rules, then you're actually going to be able to read up to 95% of the English language. So that's a remarkable fact, a fact which most people don't realise. Actually, English isn't as irregular as you might first seem. You, you can learn rules and these rules are really going to help you learn to read and write the huge majority of the English language. Now, we're not saying that phonic systems are perfect. Of course, we're not getting 100% accuracy here. We're only getting 90 to 95%. But our argument is this. Isn't it better to be able to have a rule for 90, 90 to 95% of words and then be forced to memorize just 5% of the English language as opposed to needing to memorize 100% of the English language? Of course, that's a far more difficult task. Okay, so let's now just have a look at phonics compared to whole language, which is the other main reading system available today. Okay, let's look at the first word we've got here on this slide, chicken. Now, if we look at the word chicken, uh, then we'll see that it's breaking up into a few different component parts. We've got the ch, the i, the k, and the e, and the n, chicken. Now, let's look at the word beneath it, chin. Now, my question is this. If you'd learnt to read chicken phonically, could you actually read the word chin? Let's imagine you've never seen the word chin before. Can you read it? Well, the answer is yes. Why is the answer yes? Because all the component parts in the word chin have already been learnt in and discovered in the word chicken. We've got the ch, the i, and the n. So you might never have seen it. You might even even know what the word means, but you can still read it. And that's the beautiful thing about phonics. You learn the tools, you apply these tools even to words you aren't familiar with, and you can decode them. In other words, you can read them. If this were whole language, however, we'd have to learn the words one by one on an individual basis because in whole language, they actually, in its pure form anyway, don't teach the sounds the letters make. What they do is they just show you a word and get you to memorize it. So that as if it was the word chicken, they might show you a picture of the word chicken, show you a flashcard with the picture of a chicken, flashcard with the word chicken written on it, put the two together, and after a while, the child will recognize that the, this collection of lines on the page actually gets you the word chicken. But there's a lot of work involved in that. What are some other problems with whole language? Well, because you have to word, learn words on an individual basis, one at a time, it really limits your ability to learn huge numbers of words because it's just too taxing on the memory. In fact, in a lot of schools or educational systems like Australia, they, they have things like reading quotas where they ask you to teach, say, 500 words to children in their first year of school, and so on and so forth each year, but the problem is, let's imagine that children learn 500 words every year at school. Well, let's even say that there are seven years at school, let's count prep. Uh, then seven times 500 gets you three and a half thousand words. But the English language has a few hundred thousand words in it, which means that even if they learn these few th thousand words by the end of their primary school years, there's still a lot of words they're not going to be able to read. Whereas remember, if we use a phonics-based system, then we're going to be able to decode up to 95% of these of any word that appears, and our job is simply then to start memorizing the final 5 to 10%. So it's a lot easier. Now another problem uh, with whole language is that words that look the same often tend to get confused. So uh, imagine we had uh, the word, um, even words, uh, let's imagine the word bun and the word fun. Okay, they're a little bit different, but they have two or three letters which are the same, bun and fun. So sometimes if a child just looks quickly at these words, 
then they, they can confuse them quite easily. Or sometimes you can imagine letters like T and L can get confused because there's not a big difference between the way they're written. A T is simply an L with a slight crossbar. So you can see again that if these words are written down on paper and the child doesn't learn to decode them letter by letter, then it's, can ease, these words can easily get confused. Okay, as a teacher, you're going to be teaching our program. Well, one of the, the th issues that might arise is you're going to get parents who come up to you and say, look, I appreciate that you're using a phonic system, but I'm not convinced. I mean, I've heard different accounts on phonics programs. I'm not sure whether they're really as good as people say they are. Uh, do you have any proof for this? Well, one thing you might like to do is just tell them that right now, all the key English-speaking countries in the world, or well, the two primary ones, the UK and the United States, have actually legislated for phonics. In other words, I've said, you know what? In our countries, you have to teach, at least in the public schools, phonics reading programs. And this occurred actually quite a long time back now in the United States in 1995 and in 1998 in the UK. So if you go to these countries in the, the government-run schools, they're going to all be using phonics programs. Why? Because they tried whole language, it got terrible results, there was a literacy crisis, and eventually they said, you know what, enough is enough. Let's go back to the tried and true method, a method which had worked for centuries before whole language came in, in other words, phonics, and let's start teaching that yet again. Where do the Fitzroy readers stand in relation to all this? Again, this could be a question that parents ask you. Well, the best thing about the Fitzroy readers is quite simply that they were created, in fact, almost two decades before this legislation came in in the United States. They've been in the classroom since 1976. So the thing about them is they've had all of this classroom exposure. Right now, in fact, we're up to our eighth fully revised readers edition. So what we've been doing over this time is we've been learning from feedback. We've been learning from the mistakes that we've been making in the classroom and constantly upgrading our program to the point that we can be absolutely confident that it is supremely effective and will work brilliantly in the classroom because we've just seen it so many times. This can be contrasted to many programs on the market today that were created in a sort of a theoretical vacuum and they haven't had the time in the classroom. And so in theory they often sound good, but in classroom there can be many problems that arise. So with our program, we've had that classroom exposure, which is actually a critical thing in creating a very effective reading program. Okay, so that is a basic introduction to phonics and how it works in our system. You might need to revise this video. As I said, if you're unfamiliar with the basic sounds the letters make, you're going to need to do a little bit of homework. You're gonna either need to go to our teaching resources already in our program, like the Fitzroy sounds, listen to the CD there, learn the basic letter sounds, or if you want, you can just go onto the internet and you know find some page which teaches you these letter sounds. But remember, you can't teach our program without knowing all the basic letter sounds very, very thoroughly. So good luck with your phonics study, uh, and I'll see you on the next video shortly. Thank you.